Hey folks, welcome to the Artificial Life Advanced class. Good news, everybody. Things are better. Let's start by taking a look at what's been going on on the T2 tile grid for the last 10 days or so. Had a new engine getting distributed along with new physics. So there's a bunch of different things here that are important. I'll talk about some of it afterwards. Uh, the uh, contact warnings uh, uh, when in, uh, the diamonds are bumping into each other or bumping into the edge of the universe, uh, they've been toned down to make it easier to see. Uh, so there, for example, uh, so right in there, uh, that used to be much more blurry, but it's following the same old pattern, right, where I, uh, <laughs> uh, when I first design something, first get it running, I, it's, it's taking up all kinds of screen real estate. But as I move on, everything that used to be all over the place gets smaller and smaller and smaller because I want to have visual space left for whatever is actually new. And what's new now is the, the loops in the, uh, uh, around the diamond sequencer. But <clears throat> this is running quite quickly. <laughs> by T2 tile standards, um, and it's been running solid. It's, it's been running for 10 days or something like that. I'm going to let it keep running uh, until it <clears throat> stops running by itself, unless I get much better uh, code. I'd like to let it run for another maybe a week or so. We'll see. Um, but this is encouraging. Um, and this is part of the reason why, <laughs> uh, why things are better. So, all right. And the main point is, yeah, it's still alive. That was yesterday, but it's still alive today. I just checked. So the goals uh, for this time, for today, was self-copying program, loads and runs. Did not achieve that, but there was progress across the board, and that's why I'm feeling pretty good. So the T2 grid speed up, that's what we were just seeing. Uh, in addition to, you know, tweaking the graphics and so forth, uh, I made an incredibly simple change that made a huge difference. And, and this is it. Uh, can, can you see it? <laughs> uh, this little three-line function took the first line and made it the last line and it made a huge change. So what this is, uh, the whole MFMT2, the engine that performs all of the sequencing and the running of the, the events and all that stuff on the T2 tiles, uh, is based on a priority queue, a time-based thing, so that whenever it finishes doing whatever it was just doing, it goes and finds the thing that has the earliest deadline, the thing that most wants to go, either the thing that's nearest in the future or the thing that is in the past if we have overrun our time. And then we call it, and the on timeout method is what gets called. And so what this does is the first thing it does is it puts itself back on the time queue, the TQ, uh, um, for redisplay MIS in the future. Now, in this case, it was a sixth of a second. So I was doing six frames a second. And then I check for touchscreen input, and then I redisplay everything, and then that's it. And then we go on about other business, like, for example, performing events uh, on the, uh, the sites of the grid. Uh, uh, but as we got more and more custom graphics with the co contact warnings and then the, con the pocket chains with their long, sh long downstream side and their short upstream side and so forth, somewhere along there, it got to the point where the, the redisplay function could take more than a sixth of a second. So what happens? We put it back on the time cube for a sixth of a second from now. We take more than a sixth of a second, and then we release ourselves, and we immediately are at the top of the queue again. So we just get displayed again, and everybody else who's trying to get in to do events on sites gets starved. They, they get an event every so often and so on. But... This, I think, explains uh, some weird behavior, one of these worries that I didn't even actually talk about, uh, that goes all the way back, you know, months, if not years, where every so often, especially before I got the fans going to keep everything cool, 
Some of the tiles, especially in the center of the grid where they would get hot, uh, they start slowing their clock down um, to try to maintain, to, to control the temperature. And sometimes, not often, I would see a specific tile that essentially was paralyzed. And, you know, e even stuff that was moving from adjacent tiles would get stuck trying to go into this thing. And I couldn't figure out why. I suspect it may have been a problem like this. So now what I have done is I have taken the, uh, don't insert it back into the uh, time queue until the end, until after after you've finished redisplaying. So this is the kind of top-down control freak, I want six redisplays a second. This is the bottom-up, uh, you know, best effort. Don't call me again for at least a sixth of a second. That's what it says here. So we do all our work, however long that takes. And then we say, okay, we have a sixth of a second to go do other things. In fact, I have now changed this to a third of a second as well. And that's what we were just seeing. And um, yeah, we can actually look at it. Uh, so here, I just uh, shot it with my phone, right? And so this is real time, no time lapse at all. And, you know, we can see you can see the HC3 grid compressions uh, moving through uh, the dots. You can see the, the loops moving around from place to place. Now, you know, <laughs> this is fast in, in no sense, uh, uh, but it's faster than it was. And uh, you can see the new revised little subtle contact warnings there, the little orange things. Uh, um, and all I really need, I mean, the grid cam time lapse, which is mostly what we're looking at, takes one frame every five seconds. You know, redisplay Miz could be a fifth, uh, well, could be four seconds, could be two seconds, three seconds, whatever. So this is much better. This is a longstanding anxiety of mine is eased. So great. Uh, the timeline has improved. Th this is what the timeline looked like last time. Uh, didn't have state machines, didn't have the HC3 sequencer. That's the what's now called the diamond sequencer. It wasn't really working and so forth. This is what it looks, whoops. This is what it looks like today. I am calling, we have HC3 sequencer. We have state machine, got some examples. Uh, uh, the redeploy, redeploy centers we don't have yet. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we've still got little bits and pieces of stuff, but this makes me feel like there's a real shot. <laughs> Just getting kind of worried. Uh, uh, the last update, well, the last couple of updates, the things were going pretty slow. Um, but progress. And a big reason for that progress is because Diamond Sequencer programs are actually running. Yeah, uh, and let's take a look at a demo. Is that what's next? Uh, um, yes. Okay, and so I've got this just started up. Uh, so the LL1s are, are just seeds that place proto loops in the place, and we'll just let this go for a little while. Okay, so now three of the four L1s have popped out. Uh, so we have a marker in, so the, the southwest, the red uh, d diamond sequencer pocket, DSPs, we have four pockets. Uh, the, the southwest is the red one, it, which is output in this case. If this can be rearranged, the northwest is green, which is supposed to be input. The north, sorry, northwest, uh, uh, northeast is uh, blue, which is temporary storage. And southwest is white, which is the execution stream. And in the ex execution stream, we have the loader, uh, where <clears throat> the idea is the loader is going to take the ancestor code, whatever it is that's stored someplace, and as the loop in the instruction stream relaxes and gets bigger, the loader inserts the instructions for the ancestor into this primordial cell. So if we let this run a little bit, the important point to notice, you know, it's all about bopping around and, and doing its thing, but the markers stay in the DSPs uh, uh, southwest, northwest northeast and the loader stays in the instruction stream and in fact you know it's got a couple of zongs in here that's an rs down there that's a reset instruction and so forth the pro the loader is inserting the program into the instruction loop and none of it is executing why because the loader is hogging the DSP, the domain sequencer pocket. And it's going to stay there now because it's working until the uh, program is entirely uh, uh, loaded into the loop. Oh, and it just took itself out there. Uh, uh, and then it decayed away to an empty codon. 
and marked the instruction stream as we have to move on to the next instruction. And that's how we boot in the domain sequence or programming language. It's actually working. Yeah, um, so that's pretty good. And we'll see another example or two uh, in a minute. And finally, uh, construction arm constructed. What does that mean? Well, you know, what we there, there's a uh, John von Neumann, sort of the, you know, father of computing in many ways. Uh, one of the many things he did was he built the this uh, cellular automata. Uh, it's kind of blocking me here. Uh, um, that it reproduces itself. So it's in the very much in the same spirit of what our artificial life creation countdown challenge that we're doing right here right now is, except the nature of the cellular automata that we're using is very very different. Uh, um, his was deterministic, synchronous, all of that stuff, because uh, <clears throat> it was a it was a proof of principle, and it's the, what we're doing here is a proof of principle too. But it's a different principle. It's the principle of bottom up, robust first, uh, and so forth. And so the important point for this story, so you know the, these uh, this this yellow line you can see down here. If you actually go to Wikipedia, it's a blue line because I've inverted all this stuff. Uh, um, that's the actual instruction string. That's like sticking off hell and gone to wherever, you know? And we're saying, no, nah, that's not really very practical, especially if we want the entire thing to move. Uh, the von Neumann universal constructor can only move by making copies of itself. It can't actually get up and go anywhere like our cells can. That's an example of the difference in flavor, even though we're making a constructor that constructs itself. And in particular, <clears throat> One key step of it is that there's a tape of some kind, which is going to be the instruction loop in uh, ARSCIS system and is that big long line of states in von Neumann's original universal constructor uh, that tell this construction arm, another automata that functions like an operating system. I don't know if that's great Wikipedia language, but you know, whatever. Uh, uh, but the point is the construction arm can move around and deposit stuff in various places and, and that's a part of well that's the main thing about how it makes copies since the construction arm goes zero one one zero one one and so forth so we have a construction arm. let's see uh here we are okay uh, um this, this is just a minute or so so these start out looking like uh whoops oh phew. oh all right that's what you get for pushing the wrong button. Uh, these start out looking like what we just saw uh, in the uh, uh, in the demo, uh, um, but they're going to start diverging in a minute. And the program is getting loaded into them, and the program is starting to execute. And look at this. These little guys here, little beans here. They head towards the wall, and ah, they take a turn. And all this stuff is going on all at once. The the thing is, the, the grid is growing. The grid is moving around on the larger uh, uh, background of events. And it's building a box. Uh, uh, and the important point of that is that <clears throat> the box is largely an arbitrary shape that I just picked last night uh, uh, to demo. And then the cell suicides. The cell has pre-programmed cell death to leave the box behind, uh, a box made out of wall atoms. It'll take a minute for this last one, last being, to uh, make its box because, in fact, you know, it was close to the wall, actually, and when you get contact warnings, it takes longer to grow and can't actually build the box until it gets, uh, until the cell gets big enough. So look at that. <laughs> and, you know, how do we do that? Uh, um, here's our revised uh, sample ancestor code, and look at that. North, west, 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 south, 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 east, 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 and so forth. Capital W means withdraw the construction arm one step and leave behind a wall atom. And dot means we're done. The program is running and performing arbitrary uh, business, arbitrary acts. So that's what gives me hope. You know, control in the pockets, chaos around, we've kind of got that. So... I'm calling this the big comeback, you know, because I was getting a little bit worried. And our, our three raggedy, the saddest little boxes you're ever likely to see is the evidence of the comeback. And so that is it. Uh, the next update will not be until December. We are now entering a pre-programmed hold at T-3. Uh, um, <clears throat> the goals for then is to have program, a proto-ancestor code running. We shall see. 
publish a book, talk about that later. I didn't write it, uh, uh, and I want to have big fun. And thank you so much for coming, and I hope to see you in December.